Thank you, Nora, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. Uh, I get to provide part one of this event presentation. Uh, this series is entitled Hypotension Prediction, A New Frontier of Critical Care. And the first lecture, or the lead-off lecture, is intended to establish some foundational principles uh, around blood pressure management and hypotension in the intensive care unit. I'm a practicing physician at Carolina's Medical Center in Charlotte, and this is going to be a clinically based and clinically oriented uh, presentation. But we have disclosures. I've worked with Edwards Life Sciences in the past, uh, specifically providing um, education focused on hemodynamics, shock, and resuscitation. The goals of this content are fairly straightforward. I'm going to review our current understanding of blood pressure as a marker of cardiovascular wellness. We'll highlight the dangers associated with systemic hypotension in acute critical illness, uh, separating both their utility in recognizing high-risk patients, but also uh, the risk of even brief hypotension among the patients that we're managing in the intensive care unit. And we'll review opportunities to improve outcomes by minimizing and avoiding hypotension in the patients that we take care of every single day. Uh, our paradigms of shock are, are complex. Um, it doesn't come as, as a surprise to this audience that when we manage patients in shock at the bedside, we often categorize that shock by uh, several different tiers. We certainly recognize or strive to identify the underlying disease. We try to categorize the shock into specific patterns to help us both implement the correct therapies and make sure we have the correct diagnoses. But uh, we often underestimate uh, the first step of shock uh, management, which is shock recognition. And uh, specifically understanding the physiology of shock, the compensatory response to shock, and therein categorizing our shock in our patients. While acute circulatory failure is defined by inadequate oxygen delivery and hypotension uh, is not in that definition, many people continue to believe that hypotension is the sine qua non of shock. It is true that uh, hypotension is a um, defining feature of uncompensated shock, but recognize that the majority of the patients that we take care of every single day, or that we have a first attempt to resuscitate out of uh, cardiovascular insufficiency, have a normal blood pressure. They're able to compensate. They're able to preserve their systemic blood pressure. They're in a compensated form of shock. Although it's harder for us to recognize patients in that uh, stage of shock, the truth is uh, they are much more treatable. The, the outcomes of patients that we recognize and treat in compensated shock are far better than patients when they've reached that final stage of uncompensated shock um, that, that foretells exhaustion of our physiologic mechanisms. Uh, this is not a new construct. The paradigms of managing patients with acute blood loss, whether that's medical or traumatic, uh, our attempts to recognize cardiogenic shock early, well before the onset of hypotension and severe malperfusion, are paradigms that we've been using for years. And I'll highlight that our new interest in cardiogenic shock has um, reignited an interest in our ability to recognize cardiogenic shock early well before the patient is an extremist as exemplified by the apex of this pyramid in red. The physiology of blood pressure protection is interesting. We as uh, humans are similar to other large mammals in that our physiology is, um, is designed to protect blood pressure and not blood flow. This is a simple experimental model. You've probably seen this um, a demonstration or something akin to it in the past, and it shows our ability to preserve blood pressure despite fairly severe acute circulating, blo circulating blood volume loss, in this case, a hemorrhage model. And so um, uh, persistent normotension um, is the norm in the majority of our patients despite acute circulating blood loss greater than 20%. So this is just an example of how robust our compensatory mechanisms are and how um, we are li literally built to preserve blood pressure. Uh, the mechanisms by which that occurs are well known to you. We take those, um, those compensatory mechanisms as important signs for us to recognize a patient in the early stages of shock as exemplified by the cartoon on the right side of the screen. This is a, an experimental demonstration and an unpublished um, 
model that exemplifies the same thing I just mentioned before, that despite a uh, severe physiologic stressor or illness, uh, the animal is able to protect blood pressure for an extended period of time. Um, that category in yellow is the period of compensated shock. And then finally, once that physiologic reserve is exhausted, is overwhelmed by the physiologic stressor, only then does the animal go into uncompensated shock, which is heralded by hypotension. Now, this idea that hypotension is important uh, has been around for a long time, but it is important for us to recognize that we've gathered a lot of information over the past 20 years to show just how dangerous it is for our patients. Some of the work I'm gonna show you in the next two slides is from a, a longstanding colleague and researcher who put a big spotlight on the risk of hypotension among patients presenting the emergency department. This data set is from patients in the out of hospital setting, but it shows some important points. Number one, the risk of even brief hypotension increases with decile of age. Okay, it's more important for their older patients. They don't suffer the consequences of hypotension lightly. The other important point is what we, um, we demonstrated is that the that systemic blood pressure threshold of a systolic blood pressure of 90 to 100 uh, is important. Falling below that threshold um, is an inflection point on the curve of danger for our patients. And the last point is uh, the demonstration on the left of the slide that shows even brief episodes of hypotension, self-limited hypotension, um, are important for our patients. They portend that the patient is in um, dire straits and needs our attention. This is another cohort with similar data from the emergency department. Again, the degree, the duration, and even episodic hypotension is dangerous to our patient. Now, this was important information because it was a, a charge for us to recognize high-risk patients early. This was a data set that was compelling for us to recognize that even brief hypotension is dangerous to our patient. It, um, it pushed us to recognize that finding quickly, to get into the room and understand the patient's physiology, to implement treatments and resuscitation that was going to change the trajectory of that illness. Many of us have incorporated that same paradigm and those same thresholds into our resuscitation protocols in the hospital. Um, hypotension below that systolic of 90 or a mean of less than 65 is a standard criteria for my and probably your high-risk sepsis clinical pathway. And um, the corollary to that is we use these same thresholds as therapeutic targets. Uh, I like to simplify some of our resuscitation tenants when it's possible. What you see on the right is the education that we provide in our education around sepsis and general shock, meaning let's make sure the patient has a sustained mean arterial pressure greater than 65 millimeters of mercury. Let's start norepinephrine at a reasonable dose um, uh, right out of the gate so that we get the patient blood pressure support that they need. And the last tenant is probably even more important in today's world because we recognize, as I'm going to show you in a couple of slides, that even brief hypotension in our patients is dangerous. Hypo hypotension is dangerous because it is a sign of, of the patient's severity of illness, but we recognize that even under our care, even brief episodes of hypotension that are potentially avoidable are important for the patient. So we're intolerant of hypotension now. And while our historic paradigm is to fluid resuscitate and only after exhaustion of fluid resuscitation do we add a vasopressor, I want you to think of those as, um, as therapeutics that we can apply in concert rather than uh, in series. Now, um, I'm a bedside clinician. I wanna provide some, um, some call outs to things I've recognized through uh, years of invested practice. And that um, even when we recognize that hypotension is a dangerous sign, there's a pitfall. There's a pitfall because not every patient, especially in the early throes of hypotension, shows immediate signs of hyperperfusion. And that creates a opportunity for us to come to illogical rationalizations, to believe this patient doesn't, looks too good to have that blood pressure at 80, to believe that the normal mentation tells us that hypotension is not important. And I would also highlight that we tend to use a lot of euphemisms in uh, medicine to include calling hypotensive shock, a little hypotension or a soft blood pressure. And that is important because it minimizes the importance of that finding. It sends the message to our team that it's not as dangerous for the patient as it really is. 
Um, so beware of these signals, beware of these communication faults, um, and recognize again that hypotension is dangerous. All right, now what about the evidence for hypotension in the intensive care unit? Well, in the past five years, we've got some growing information out of some very large and well-constructed databases. It's important to recognize um, this data set as slightly different than the data from the pre-hospital and emergency medicine setting where the intention was to recognize high-risk patients. Um, once the patient gets to the intensive care unit, they're there for a reason. Someone has recognized them as being critically ill. We have a working diagnosis. We know that they have an important disease and that blood pressure restoration or blood pressure support is one of our foundational points. But even despite that, and in all of these case series, recognize that cumulative hypotension was dangerous to our patient, that even brief episodes of hypotension um, was associated with acute kidney injury, acute myocardial infarction, and death, death at 30 days or thereafter, meaning it was a very important marker. Now, obviously, we didn't randomize these patients to suffer hypotension, but these were independent markers of adverse outcome. And again, recognize that these patients were suffering this hypotension under our watch in the intensive care unit when blood pressure management was one of our goals. And so to me, this is a call out for us to be even more protective of our patients when it comes to avoiding and uh, reversing hypotension. This is some of the work um, from my group uh, over the past years where we took a specific interest in the intersection of emergency airway management and hemodynamics. And what you'll notice at the bottom of the slide is that a large number of our patients in the emergency department and in the intensive care unit suffer shock following intubation that was not present, hypotensive shock at least, that was not present prior to the intubation, an incidence between one in four and one in two. And it wasn't benign for our patients. Post-intubation hypotension, again, was independently associated with adverse outcomes in these patients. So another forewarning sign, hypotension is dangerous for our patients. We need to be watchful. We need to be vigilant to avoid and protect our patients from hypotension when possible. Well, how do we do that? Well, one of the mechanisms is recognizing patients well before they get into uncompensated shock. Again, the signs on the left um, or the signatures on the right that we use at the bedside every single day are useful for us to recognize when a patient is in the throes of attempted compensation. Tachycardia or relative tachycardia codified by a shock index, abnormal um, perfusion with distal vasoconstriction as an attempt to maintain blood pressure in the face of falling stroke volume or cardiac output, supernormal lactate, subnormal SCVO2. These are all helpful markers at the bedside to recognize that a patient is physiologically attempting to compensate for abnormal oxygen delivery. So use these in a patient, even with normal blood pressure, to recognize their need of resuscitation. Now, why is that shock bad? Well, this is um, a, an illustration to show you a couple points. Uh, this is another animal model, and this is using intravital microscopy of the small intestine. And what you're going to see at baseline is um, fairly normal gut perfusion. This is a hemorrhage model, and it's a non-lethal hemorrhage model. It's a hemorrhage model that approximates just under 25% circulating blood vols which you'll remember is a threshold that typically does not induce hypotension. And what you're going to see here is that even with 10 and subsequently 20% circulating blood loss, you have significant alterations of gut microperfusion. This is compensation at work. This is the body diverting circulating blood flow from the gut, which is not essential at that moment in time, to other organs that are. Um, this is what's happening even for brief moments of um, uncompensated and compensated shock in our patients. This is the reason they suffer end organ dysfunction. This is the reason that the systemic inflammatory response is upregulated in the context of shock because um, even precious minutes of gut malperfusion can lead to uh, gut barrier breakdown. Um, so I don't want you to minimize the consequences of even uncompensated shock. If we had intravital microscopy in all the patients that we're managing on a daily basis, we would be much more um, 
insightful as to the underlying consequences of malperfusion. A couple important take home points. Number one, uh, as I mentioned before, our greatest benefit of recognizing shock is recognizing patients in early form of uncompensated shock. It's our greatest potential for rapid reversal, um, but it comes at the, with the corollary that it's harder to recognize, okay? Compensatory clinical signs are imperfect. I would add that they're often underappreciated, which is a opportunity for us as providers uh, to be more vigilant, to be more diligent. But we also need to uh, expect um, more insight based on uh, a new generation of hemodynamic monitoring. Another way of saying the same thing is that there are physiologic insights beneath the services of our current monitoring. And the addition of these insights um, may help provoke us to recognize shock early, to recognize high-risk patients with forewarning signs that are clinically imperceptible to us and lead us to treat patients more aggressively and differently than we did before, and therein um, avoid, avoid episodes of hypotension and the consequences of that to our patient. Let's summarize a couple take-home points. Blood pressure is an important, but unfortunately, an imperfect sign of cardiovascular wellness. Blood pressure is strongly protected. And what that means is we only develop hypotension in the context of an overwhelming uh, physiologic stress. That means uncompensated shock, heralded by hypotension, is a late sign, an insensitive sign um, for our patient's degree of illness. But we need to recognize that it's a true red alert. Even episodic and transient hypotension is an important and dangerous sign for our patients. Don't underestimate it. Next, compensated shock is an important opportunity for early care and resuscitation. It's an earlier sign of illness. It is a patient population uh, that are more amenable to early and appropriate treatments. But the hard part is recognizing compensated shock. Recognition rests on clinical diligence and understanding the typical and classic compensatory markers of shock, coupled with some of our uh, new biomarkers and other laboratory findings that substantiate those abnormalities. Now, another interesting point is that there's a lot under the surface. Subclinical insights into cardiovascular physiology are available to us. Prediction algorithms may help us recognize signs of early physiologic stress that are unappreciated at the bedside and predict onset of hypotension before it occurs. That's an introduction to the next lecture in this series. Thank you for participating.